Okay, welcome to another episode of the Regenerative Health Podcast. This evening, I'm sitting down with Dr. Peter Walsh. He's a GP and metabolic health doctor uh, at Yarra Trail Medical Center in the uh, northern suburbs of uh, Melbourne, Australia. Peter, thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks very much for having us, Max. Pleasure. Cool. So give us a bit of a background on yourself. Yeah, sure. Uh, so as, as you say, I'm a, I'm a GP by training, though increasingly I sort of find myself doing somewhat specialised work in the low-carb uh, keto keto carnivore space with patients who suffer a range of metabolic conditions, disorders, um, uh, including, as you say, a lot of work in the polycystic ovarian syndrome space, uh, women who uh, have major disruption to their fertility and trying to get pregnant, and that, that makes up a big part of my metabolic work these days, but also diabetics um, or people with, with, with metabolic syndrome uh, more generally. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's the kind of work I'm doing at the moment. But, um, yeah, I mean, my background is um, a bit a bit varied, actually. I kind of have a, I, I describe it as a backwards career that in the sense I was a scientist first and then I became a doctor later. I went to medical school in my 30s after um, a background in a degree in biochemistry, and then uh, I did an honours 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 degree, and then uh, went on and did a PhD in molecular and cell biology, and uh, worked as a postdoctoral research fellow uh, around some of the institutions in Melbourne that are well known to people, St Vincent's and uh, uh, Bio Twenty One Institute, in Melbourne Uni, and then yeah, then sort of had, had a uh, I guess a crisis, a crisis of purpose, and decided I needed to be a bit more patient focused and. Went to medical school, and, you know, in my thirties with children and a mortgage, and uh, uh, yeah, somehow survived and popped out the other end and became a GP. So uh, here I am. Yeah, great. And uh, the reason I wanted to get Dr. Walsh on the podcast is because uh, you had an, an absolutely amazing talk on polycystic ovary syndrome on the Low Carb Down Under uh, YouTube page, and that was a really, really good twenty-minute, very concise explanation of this disorder which is affecting so so many people and it's interesting that you've gone through the science before you've done the clinical medicine but to me that that really speaks to the fact that you've you've got a lot of experience and a really holistic ability to understand what exactly is going wrong um, with with people's metabolic health on on a cellular um subcellular level so um, yeah, really excited to to talk to you today. So, so Peter, give us an idea um, about what is going on with this condition called polycystic ovary syndrome. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and look, there's no doubt it's a complex uh, syndrome, and uh, it, it well, it basically in, in involves a disruption um, to to the normal uh, fertility hormone cycle uh, that that ultimately leads to. Um, you know, the, 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 the symptoms that, that, that people uh, experience. And so the syndrome is defined by um, or can, can be can be defined by three, three uh, criteria. Um, yeah, so, so one of those, as the name suggests, is having polycystic ovaries on ultrasound. Um, and uh, so, you know, greater than 20 ovaries per, per uh, follicles per ovary um, on ultrasound. Um, but you don't actually need to have that in order to have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So your ovaries can actually be non-polycystic, um, which is a bit of a misnomer, really. But uh, the, the other, the others are signs of androgen excess, uh, and and that could be, you know, a range of conditions. So obviously, uh, you know, all, all the ones we think of around testosterone, around excess hair, or male pattern baldness in women uh, are, are the more obvious ones. But acne is probably the more common presentation, actually. Uh, you see that a lot in a lot of teenagers. Um, who present with this syndrome, and and the other the third the third diagnostic criteria is to have a, a disruption to your regular regular period cycle. It usually um, uh, infrequent periods is is the presenting complaint. Yeah, and um, androgenism or basically masculinization. So signs or symptoms that uh, norm, the normal feminine characteristics are being maybe influenced or or uh, replaced with or ha have influence of, of masculinization. And as you mentioned, Peter, um, hirsutism or hair, male pattern hair on the female face, like on the chin or, or under, the, under the nose, um, male pattern baldness and, and acne are all, all signs of, 
hirsutism, uh, as well as uh, raised androgen hormones that we can can measure uh, in the blood. So w- what I guess um, the what the way I like to think about PCOS um, by, by from a mechanistic point of view is a metabolic dysfunction or um, insulin resistance manifested in young women. And when you gave your talk at Low Carb Down Under, you called it type 4 diabetes. So give us a bit of an idea about the background to that and, and why do why would we consider it something like a type 4 diabetes? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And and so if you read if you read the papers on on, on polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS, or not to, if I refer to it, does that, that's what I mean. So uh, for PCOS, it, there's there's a lot of hypotheses around what are the causes of PCOS, and the, the, every single publication does refer to insulin uh, as one of those uh, causes or potential causes. But there's a lot of people chasing uh, a, a lot of rabbits down holes in a very academic way that I think uh, are quite really really quite quite distracting to to the main picture, which is 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 in fact that this is primarily. Uh, a disease driven by insulin and you know the way I describe it to my patients uh, is that they're actually I say look you know jokingly say congratulations you're actually you're actually super fertile in a way and then then go through as I did in my talk I think briefly briefly touched on this that you know we we, as mammals and human mammals um, we we have our fertility closely linked to the, the the amount of readily available food in our environment and and that's a really great evolutionary response um, um, to match to match up you know uh, uh, fertility to to um, the availability of enough food so that you can carry a baby to term and breastfeed that baby to maturity um, and so that this is the whole you know the reason we everyone gets very excited in spring and squirrels get excited in spring because the food comes on right and and and, and as I'm joking about kangaroos too in, in the talk it, all mammals have this phenomenon and and so if you don't have enough food and you get too thin, it's a well no well accepted fact. I mean, this is not just a you know scientific fact, but it's it's well accepted in, in, in you know common parlance that if people get too thin, they they become infertile, and everyone knows that their cycle turns off and so on. And uh, early in my uh, GP career, I looked after a, a number of uh, middle distance runners, elite um, female middle distance runners, and you could see them you know fluctuate their their, their um, BMI would sit you know around pretty low actually 18, 19, 20 and you know two weeks into the off season they'd gain a kilo and a half and suddenly their cycle would come back after not having it for six months during heavy training and and and, and running pretty lean so it's it's a well known well described phenomenon and 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 so that I say to my patients well the other thing that's happening is well as, as that turns back on what's what's happening what are the signals um, for that and that and that signaling process is quite complex but at its heart um, uh, is insulin. And, and insulin uh, says, um, good times, guys, like plenty of, plenty of carbohydrates around, uh, plenty of food around, because some of it's, not, it's not just carbohydrates that stimulate insulin. It, obviously, they do stimulate it far more strongly than, than fats and proteins. But, it, it, you know, insulin is, is, is part of the signaling. And, and no doubt ghrelin and leptin, uh, you know, the hunger and society hormones, and a whole range of other factors are involved in this process. But I, I feel, my, certainly my reading of the literature is that that's fine print and insulin drives this process primarily. And so as you get more insulin in your system, which is signaling that you have more food around um, and you're gaining more weight, you become increasingly fertile. And 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 I think that the way I describe it to patients, whether that's, whether that's scientifically correct, I, you know, I, I, I'm happy to have the argument, but that, that, that actually your insulin continues to get higher and higher and higher as your insulin, uh, you know, resistance grows and, and then actually you become super fertile and ironically uh, that ends up making you infertile. So, and, and again, I touched on this really briefly without going into the um, the mechanics of the, the hormones of, of, of the female reproductive cycle, there is a sequence uh, in which that, that that needs to run, and it needs to run in a very particular uh, both the sequence and the amounts of hormones that are present in that sequence. And um, what what you find in order in order for an egg to actually be released, right, in order for ovulation to actually run, and so and part of that process is kind of this competitive this fight between um, follicles that are maturing inside an ovary, and. The really crucial step that, that goes wrong in polycystic ovarian syndrome is that one of those follicles needs to dominate the others and become become the lead follicle. So it's kind of like this, there's this elbowing and this, this race that's going on. 
and finally one dominates and then and then it can go on go on through to develop fully mature fully and then and then the egg be released and the super fertility nature of that is that unfortunately you're developing rather than just developing maybe three or four um, uh, follicles early follicles that one can then dominate the others quite easily if you're developing 30 follicles all at once it's really hard for one of them to dominate to, to outcompete all of the other ones in, in horm hormone uh, sensitivity and, and hormone amounts so um, it's kind of this super fertility concept that actually ironically stops you from releasing one of those eggs um, yeah so it, it I think that's a that's a reasonable explanation um, for people to tell to patients and that's sort of how I like to communicate it yeah and the point about the subfertility during lean times I mean that that's yeah as you said very very well acknowledged fact and for the the purpose that the body isn't going to ovulate and have a, a regular cycle if it's not has a certain amount of body fat or a certain amount of micronutrients that's going to be able to sustain the development implantation development of a placenta development of the fetus and then obviously all the way through to breastfeeding so um it's it's fascinating what you describe because it's it's really almost like a u shape where you've got at, at really low levels of of nutrients and and basically restriction or excess exercise um, and the body doesn't have enough, it's switching off ovulation and, and uh, fertility. But then that it's, we're going all the way to a state where there's an abundance of energy, particularly these um, really energy-dense foods like carbohydrates um, and foods that prov promote insulin resistance, you also get this, this fertility turned off. So, um, and the, obviously the, the manifestation of that is, um, you know, an ovulation, which, which as Peter mentioned, is one of the, the hallmarks of, um, or diagnostic kind of criteria for, for PCOS. So, um, in terms of like the patient in front of, in front of you, I mean, typically when, or so, some, a young lady might come in and say, you know, my period is, is, uh, you know, 40 days long. Um, and they've, they've got a bit, maybe they've got quite bad acne so um to you how would you approach that that patient and what would you say to them in terms of um what the next steps would be yeah well again i think you can straight away ask them if they know about pcos and not often people have heard about it and and someone has suggested to them that that might be an issue but they don't really often know much more than that that detail but you, you can say to people explain the three criteria and say that mm -hmm. one of them is an ultrasound but actually you only need two of the three in order to meet meet diagnostic criteria and and here you are you know you've got you've got widely spaced periods and, and signs of androgen excess you've got polycystic ovarian syndrome um, by definition and yeah. and then, then I, I, you know so i think you spend a bit of time explaining the background to that and then yeah. then, I, then i really like to move as with all metabolic consults so okay what are the goals here you know what what, what are we trying to achieve here and let, let's lay that out really early because it really changes the way we'll approach the, the problem and how i have all customized and optimize the program for for people and so i guess if fertility is a pressing issue um, then, then I approach that quite differently. I think to perhaps a younger younger person who um, might want to have, have a family one day, but actually they just really want their cycle to be normal. They don't want to take uh, exogenous hormones to control it, and, yeah. and, and so they just want to be, want to be healthier uh, yeah. and fitter more generally. So I think, yeah, I mean, for both of those those patients, I still sort of recommend a um, quite a strict low carb diet. In order to start, you know, reversing the, the insulin resistance that's driving that, um, yeah. But um, but yeah, I'll, I'll customize it differently depending on the goals. Yeah, and the actually the, the interesting point that um, I, I also want to touch on is the reference ranges for what's a normal number of follicles has gone um, up, as in more there are more follicles being tolerated as normal than previously. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, if you go back through the literature and over the last 30 or 40 years, you know, the people talk about having polycystic ovaries and, and you know, they're talking about originally defining it as more than seven follicles per ovary going mm. back 30 or 40 years. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, in, in today's population, I don't know how often, uh, you know, the, the audience, are, you know, whether they're GPs and they're listening and whether, they, whether they're doing uh, pelvic ultrasounds on their patients very often, but the, the, the chance of uh, seeing eight, nine or ten um, follicles on an ovary is pretty high like these days in a, in, in you know a woman of uh, um you know reproductive age so mm. um i mean crazy high like it probably 50 percent of the population and and so yeah there's no doubt that um 
uh, this this disease is becoming more prevalent. And in mm-hmm. fact, I think, you know, as you start to see it, you know, acting in irregular periods and you've got PCOS, I mean, you can walk around, how many of your patients don't have that? You know, it's kind of, it, it's so common. And I think it's grossly underdiagnosed as a condition. And it's really not until women reach reproductive age. Uh, like I, I said in my talk, they often, these, these women are often masked on the, on the pill. Like they put on the pill for their irregular periods. They don't know that, um, that what's going on with their cycle because it's being overridden. And they just tolerate the hair or the acne and think that it's it's something else that's driving. And they often go off the pill, and, mm. you know, when they finally want to have a family, and then discover that they are functionally infertile. Um, and and they then they blame the pill for that infertility. And and um, and I spent a lot of time, you know, not that I'm a great fan of the pill, but like it's it's just that I spent a lot of time saying, look, it probably wasn't the pill that did it. You've probably been on this trajectory for the last fifteen years, and it's kind of been missed and it's been masked. Masked, and, um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, and, and that's really an unfortunate process. But to get to your point um, around the, the the diagnostic numbers, I mean, some of the estimates in in the in the research and literature are just enormous. Like, you know, talking about thirty to fifty percent of of women of reproductive age in in the developed world, but also in you know in the developing world as well. And um, you know, rates in 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 China and in India. Are, are reportedly again. I don't know how good the data is on that, but the, the, from the data that's been reported, so it says the numbers are phenomenally high there yeah. as well. Yeah. The um, it, it really reminds me of an, an analogy to the right, the falling reference ranges for sperm counts for men, and it really, uh, to me, it feels like there was a normal, you know, 50, 60, 70, 100 years ago. That was our normal, and then there's environmental changes that have happened over this past five decades, six decades, and this is impacting our, our fertility uh, and our metabolic health. And these re- what's become normal has been – or what is abnormal has been normalized because so few people are in within that normal range. Um, it's – I mean, what, what what do you think about that? Is it – do you think it's – they both have underlying uh, common causes? Yeah, look, p- perhaps. I mean, I, I think I think – the, I think the PCOS is, is really clearly um, predominantly an insulin-driven process, mm-hmm. and, and but, w- w- but women's infertility more generally, absolutely, is caused by a whole a whole range of things. There's no doubt about that, including the, the you know the chemicals we use in our you know um, agriculture um, mm. and, and food um, system. Um, but I, I actually um, I actually spend a bit of time with people. Often they've come, people who've done their research and diagnosed themselves, and they, they come to come to you as sort of they've maybe seen other people, and they come as a last resort. They're often, again, chasing chasing down rabbit holes that I think are, are, are relevant, but they think they are the fine print, and they can be a distraction from the bigger game, and the bigger game being insulin dysregulation yeah. and, and so yeah. I, I really harp on that and bring people back to that and it's and, and again it's not that i don't don't want people filtering their water or, or eating organic and, and 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 that stuff can absolutely help and i, I think that stuff probably in the, in the sperm count space is probably more important yeah um but in in polycystic ovarian syndrome i i think that um well I, I i know from my experience with people if they get their insulin under control their disease goes away and, yeah. and that's without changing any of the other factors um, in their in their lifestyle, so yeah. I, I, for me, that stuff's kind of fine print in the policy. Not, not in health overall. If you want to reduce cancer rates and so on, population wise, happy to have the conversation about that. But for polycystic ovarian syndrome, it's an insulin game. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, I guess that the, a little thing I read recently was that there was association with the increased urinary BPA, so bisphenol A, and and polycystic um, ovaries. And I'm I'm just thinking that that there is a proportion of women who are um, maybe less obese or have less visceral fat or fat around the organs and perhaps maybe things like environmental endocrine disruptors like BPA um, could be perhaps contributing to disease um, in those people where the metabolic um, symptoms or the, the, the metabolic dysfunction doesn't appear to be as obvious. Um, yeah, absolutely, mm-hmm. and it is it is a real mystery this whole concept of of, of a thin PCOS sufferer, and because you know, because originally we thought of these, these women were kind of characterised as the same people who had gallbladder disease, uh, overweight, um, you know, um, women with with clear metabolic syndrome, like clear clear you know, symptomatic signs of, of the manifestations of metabolic syndrome, and increasingly um, I'm finding that actually perhaps even the majority of the people that I work with are actually. Uh, of normal body weight, and and they mm. don't they don't suffer that, and and absolutely. So what is why why in particular? When I say to people as they come for metabolic consults, you know, there's 
there's there's sort of you know there's there's a few places that you can that metabolic disease can catch up with you, particularly uh, from the from the insulin um, side, and and obviously um, elevated blood sugar is the, the the first one of those. But then as that as that blood sugar is is sent to your liver and converted into triglyceride some of that can get clogged in your liver and you can see fatty liver or early fatty liver uh, and that's the second one and then the third one is that then of course that triglyceride needs to be transported around and that can completely throw out your cholesterol um, particularly your, your, your ldl um, you know your non-super fluffy type ldl can be thrown out because of your triglyceride level uh, and then obviously fat storage and 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 the places in particular the abdominal uh, you know fat distribution in particular that, that people with insulin um uh, dysregulation get and and then so they're the kind of four four points and i can usually go through a set of fasting blades and say well here you go you know here we can see you can see your journey here and then the, the fifth one is in women well obviously it's it's you know this kind of um hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis that that just that goes off in some women but the question is you know why why do we all have these metabolic differences and, and you know i've had a couple of great examples recently of people who have just had fatty liver you know and like just you know you see those patients occasionally just absolutely banging fatty liver they're not overweight their insulin their, their, their blood glucose is pretty normal hbo1c is pretty normal you know, um, and even their cholesterol is pretty normal. Triglyceride is not even that crazy, but but like just you know, their, their transaminases are off the chart. And so, you know, we do have these metabolic differences where where we do certain people get stuck along that that pathway, and for reasons that like, well, I don't think we understand. And 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 again, the same with like why do some people, some some women. Um, experience such a strong disruption to to their you know uh, reproductive cycle and absolutely they, 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 you know there could be other endocrine disruptors at play in that or perhaps it's just genetic differences yeah yeah and, and look that's such a fascinating point peter and you know i'm i'm seeing patients in, in my clinic and they will manifest the con- the consequences of insulin resistance in very different ways, as you, as you said, some of them will, will have you know completely normal um, uh, liver function, but they'll they'll basically be quite hypertensive, and then uh, all, all these organs, I guess, uh, people manifest their their visceral fat or their their raised waist circumference in, in all these different ways, and and as you said, how I think about PCOS is in particularly is that this is a manifestation of of insulin resistance uh in in young women i wanted to talk a little bit about specifically what what foods are maybe driving this because when you you mentioned that it's in in epidemic proportions in india and 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 china just all over the world uh i'm I'm thinking exactly of of the food groups what 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 particularly are driving this and i mean i've i interviewed tucker goodrich uh who who's done a lot of research into seed oils and the omega-6 um, polyunsaturated uh, fatty acids. And to me, I feel like every single country has their own brand of, of seed oil. I mean, in the US, it's corn and soy. Here in Australia, it's sunflower and canola. Um, I believe in, in China, they, they also have a lot of uh, soy oil. Um, what do you think about the, the polyunsaturated fatty acids? I mean, in terms of provoking metabolic disease and particularly PCOS? Yeah, I, I don't think that is the the evidence is super strong. I, I, I think I've got an open mind about it, and again, there's definitely research on it uh, suggesting associations. But I, I guess it's really hard to tease out, you know, nutritional mm-hmm. literature as you know, right? And so, association is not causation. And, and obviously, if you're eating a whole lot of starch um, and sugar uh, containing junk, it's also going to have seed oil in it. So mm-hmm. I'm kind of I'm kind of like. Um, I'm slow to jump to that to that link. I think. I mean, look, t- absolutely. I think don't eat seed oils for a whole range of other reasons, right? I'm totally on board with that. Um, but specifically to answer the question, um, I, I, I'm not convinced. Anyway, let's put it that way. I think the jury's still out on that. I'm not convinced it plays a mega role. Uh, like I say, there's certainly papers that talk about association and, and, and suggest that perhaps there is a link. Um, but for me, it's around starch and sugars, and it's just it is it is that simple. You know, it's bread, potato, pasta, rice. It's fruit. It's it's everything with sweetener in it. Particularly, I think fructose, um, you know, type sugars, um, uh, which I, I think are, are some of the biggest drivers. Yeah. Of- yeah. No. You and you you're right. It's so difficult to tease apart the individual food group and really it doesn't for all to intents and purposes is is doesn't really matter the message is that processed food is driving the accumulation of visceral fat it's making people 
uh, insulin resistant and it's causing things like uh, PCOS in, in, in young women. So, um, yeah, as, as you said, Peter, the, the starches, the sugars, um, have to go and, and how, how quickly, you know, you, obviously you, you're seeing people who are very, very motivated to change, especially if they're, um, at the end of, or at the, towards the end part of their fertile period of, in terms of age, how quickly do you see fertility return in, in women who make the, uh, eliminate low, uh, these starches and sugars? Yeah, and the answer is a bit variable, and it kind of depends on what your starting platform is. But if you've got a patient who is, you know, really in the morbidly obese category, and they're drinking a ton of soft drink, and you know, they're they and, and just just living on McDonald's five five days a week, and and all the sugary starchy McDonald's at that, and um, if those people come, I've had a couple of examples of people who, who have just decided they just want a baby, and they're kind of really. I don't know. They're, they're they're very dedicated or you know committed patients, I suppose. Despite despite these behaviours, and you say to them, I think if you said to them under any other circumstance, you know, you need a, you know, this radical diet change, they just wouldn't be willing. And in fact, I have to confess that many of these women went straight back to their diet once they once they'd had their babies. But um, they were completely dedicated to to the project. And um, I mean, I'm talking maybe you know one woman one woman was pregnant within five weeks after the first consult, you know, like it can be radical, radical mm. uh, uh, change. I mean, this, this, this is someone who was drinking maybe four litres of Coke a day wow. and, and just, you know, like really like a train wreck metabolically, but quite mm. young um, and still trying to be active. She, she, was in, she was in the exercise myth, so she was just whipping herself, you know, training harder and harder. So she was kind of had, had a lot of musculature on her and uh, she was, was pretty fit. Um, cardiovascularly, but was just just eating all this sugar. And as soon as we took that away, uh, she kept training, and she had the had, had the musculature that could could help her re- repair um, metabolically really rapidly. And and so that was probably the most extreme case. I mean, uh, these days, you know, I don't know. Probably uh, on average, maybe I'd say you know three to six months, you start to see a, a regulation of cycle. And obviously, there's other reasons people are infertile, but you know, and I don't say, look, I'm going to, you know, guarantee you something, and you can have a baby in six months. But um, you know, what what our target is is very much about like, a return of a regular uh, cycle, and hopefully, you know, somewhere around 30 days. And so I think three to six months. I've got a couple of patients at the moment, and some of them have had spectacular AMH results, anti malaria malarian hormone that I that I measure as a routine part of the workup. And obviously, it's a it's a you know it's um, Released by uh, by the ovaries, but in particular in relation to the number of follicles on those ovaries, the number of active active eggs within the, the ovary, and so uh, it's really quite a good marker, and it shifts pretty pretty quickly um, if people are doing the right thing. And so you can see an animal and hormone sitting around 45, 50, 55, and then in in a matter of weeks, maybe four to six weeks, that can halve, you know, and that, and that's a really encouraging sign, I think that. You're heading towards um, laying the foundations where fertility, or well, a regular cycle, I should say, will will return um, if you if you stay on track. So, yeah, so I think that's a really good market to measure, um, or sort of direct fertility type measure. Um, and then obviously, um, women are tracking their cycle as well as ketones and blood sugars and other things. Yeah, I mean, what what that says to me is that the the human body knows exactly what to do, and the human body wants to be fertile, and as soon as you remove the foods or the the insults that were preventing it, it you know in some cases and, and especially in, in younger women, it will just bounce back, um, you know, just like that. So I mean, it's it's great how rapid, as you said, you can see results in in certain in certain patients. Um, the the interest, I guess, and like you said, there's obviously more than one cause of of infertility or. or trouble conceiving um, and not not suggesting that everyone who has trouble conceiving is has got PCOS but to me it makes sense that optimizing or, or normalizing metabolic health is the first strategy in terms of getting someone closer to becoming fertile and then perhaps if they're having still having trouble uh, uh, ovulating or, or fully pregnant after um, normalizing that that metabolic health, then we can start looking for other causes of, of infertility. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and, and and it's a great thing to do anyway. I think it, it, it you know, the, the, we haven't really talked about the 
you know, the rates of gestational diabetes, you know, they're, they're, they're just skyrocketing and, 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 and the complications that or the over, over, overly aggressive management of a pregnancy then as a, as a result of that, people worrying about large babies and birth difficulties uh, as a result of that and also blood sugar difficulties, um, uh, you know, in, in the early hours and days of life. And um, so that, you know, it removes that sort of uh, concern, you um, yeah, so it, and just sets sets you up for a far healthier pregnancy as well. And and if you're not not already carrying you know excess weight, not that we're trying to lose weight, you know, that goal set around weight loss usually. Um, but just it, it, you know, people who do change their diet quite radically, obviously, you know, lose, lose a ton of weight as well during that process. And yeah, um, yeah, I was gonna, I was going to say too. You just reminded me, like one other thing that I that I sort of increasingly discuss with with women is around endometriosis and. The question for me is that, like, you know, uh, is this also just another one of these super fertility kind of uh, diseases where, you know, chronic overstimulation of endometrial cells, endometrial lining, you know, causes thickening of the lining and, 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 and just, and actually, I feel like it is part of this, the same spectrum in the sense that, you know, then tissue then, then can break away, drift off float down fallopian tubes in, in, into the abdominal cavity and, and seed there and then, and then cause all of the symptoms of endometriosis. And I think because of, unfortunately, once once that tissue is seeded, it seems like women that, that radically change their, their metabolic state, you don't, you don't necessarily immediately or so you know, your body doesn't immediately remove the, those cells. They don't, they don't die off just because they, you've changed your, your metabolism. Once they've seeded, they've seeded and they keep responding to your hormone cycle, irrespective of what your diet's then doing. So, you know, I think it's harder to draw uh, the cause and effect because, you know, if you take away the cause, it doesn't actually cure the illness. So you kind of almost need to have a laparoscopy and have your endometriosis um, ablated off, and then and then go on a keto diet to sort of almost prove prove that it won't come back if you're on a keto diet. So I think it's going to be a very hard one uh, to demonstrate. But my my hunch is very strongly that that it is it is also part of this insulin driven super fertile spectrum of disease. Yeah, that's a fascinating point. Um, I, again, similar to the the studies, associational studies of endocrine disruptors with PCOS, I've also read literature that is this associate a range of um, of environmental compounds. Particularly, I think the, there's a, a couple of bromine compounds that uses flame retardants that are really associated with um, rates of endometriosis. So, I mean, I think the whole big picture story, and to, to keep it broad, is that women's hormones are basically under a, a, an, an attack by env- environmental triggers and things like starches, sugars, and the high energy seed oils and the high energy environment is a key part of that. And, and the endocrine disruptors in certain women could be, could be also playing a, a, a really big role. Yeah, so um, on the topic of weight loss, look, I, I co- totally agree. I, I don't actually talk about weight. I, I like to measure waist circumference and do a weight to height ratio and my, my emphasis is on reducing that waist circumference um, because at the end of the day, it's the visceral fat that, that we really targeting. And that's specifically the fat around the organs because that, that is driving the whole metabolic inflammation and the whole um, state of dysfunction that, that is contributing to this whole picture. So yeah, I, I really like to emphasize uh, emphasize that point. I talked to Sean O'Mara and he was, he was absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, metabolic and lifestyle physician out of the US who works with um, patients to reduce their visceral fat. And he, he actually does MRI scans on their on their abdomen, um, a whole body MRI, and he really gets good results by showing patients the amount of visceral fat that they have on them. Um, yeah. And and his perspective uh, is is very interesting because he's he 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 basically has five areas of you know the drivers of visceral fat: um, processed food, um, alcohol stress, uh, chronic exercise, and poor sleep or, or circadian disruption. Mm-hmm. So um, ha- in terms of, I mean, we've talked a lot about processed foods and, and how they're driving the hyperinsulinemia and this whole phenotype, but w- have you seen in your experience any of those other four contributing to either PCOS or, or um, any other of these um, manifestations of insulin resistance in young women? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I, I uh, thanks for raising it because I, I think – I mean, out of, out of that list, um, you know, 
second to processed food and, and a close second, I think. And increasingly, actually, as I do this work, I spend more and more time talking about stress and the impacts of cortisol. And it is just out of control. In fact, the next public talk I'll give will be on cortisol and how it does this. And there's other people have been speaking about it, but I just, I feel like I just, I just need to put it out there. Like um, we, we live in a way that is so incompatible with our psychophysiology and yeah. so many of us are so, so addicted to cortisol. We live a life of, you know, just constant high cortisol production um, and, you know, adrenal system sits on the hair trigger all the time. And, yeah, it's fascinating, actually. I've got, I've got a, I don't know, a, probably a dozen or so, all, all women, actually, female patients that are on pure ketogenic diets but just cannot seem... You know, they, they get they get they stall and they, they, they lose a bit of weight and they, they can't seem to move their weight. And 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 you know, I've got them monitoring their ketones and their blood sugars. And you know, you can it, it just doesn't make sense. Some of these women are on purely carnivore diets, you know, one meal a day carnival with heroic two, three, four day fast at times. Their blood sugar it just does not shift. And mm. you know, and you see uh, then actually often people with uh, with CGMs, continuous glucose monitoring, uh, uh, you know, you can see stressful life events, emotional events mm. causing this, mm. this, this, you know, this spike in their in their their glucose or um, their dawn effect just is off the charts. You know, instead of instead of dawning to sixes or sevens, they're dawning to tens and twelves. You know that, and so I think, and if you go to literature, actually, you can see that. Like, yeah, so you know, in the rats and the the rats and the mice studies, you know, if you if you do do stress stress studies on these animals, um, you can see the massive blood sugar impacts. Of cortisol, and I, I think I was underestimating that. I think I thought, oh, yeah, it, 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 you know, it increases it a bit and makes it a bit tough. But I'm talking like two whole points or something on average in, in these in these animal studies, two to three maybe. You know, so rather than having a blood sugar of five, you got a blood sugar of eight. I mean, not yeah. an exaggeration. Right? These, are, these are pretty reasonable studies, and there's a lot of literature on that. And yeah, so increasingly, yeah. I'm emphasising that, and particularly in these stuck people, right? So not in everybody, perhaps. So I don't launch with it, but increasingly, I'm starting to see it as just part of the work. And I think, you know, who, who isn't stressed? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm guilty, mm-hmm. like you know, who, who isn't? And and you know, we live this mad Western lifestyle. We're on this 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 this, this treadmill, and um, you know, we don't we don't often take the time to de-stress the way we should. So. Yeah, look, absolutely. I think I think you know, uh, stress is is a massive massive driver. Cortisol is the hormone um, that you know the, the physiological explanation for that for emotional stress that's just driving this, as well as physiological stress. And um, yeah, chronic cortisol causes a range of problems, uh, but absolutely, it is one of the major drivers of, of metabolic syndrome in our in our population. Yeah, no, um, that's great and that's fascinating. I've I've seen myself a CGM trace and um, well, continuous glucose monitor trace for people. It's basically what it is it's a device that that, gets, that sits on the permanently for for temporarily for two weeks under the skin and samples the the fluid under the skin and basically is able to give you a, a readout of your glucose level on your phone. And I've they, they're fantastic because you can see what different factors in, of of life influence. Um, your blood sugar and which foods particularly provoke a, a high blood sugar. But I've seen traces and it nothing happened except there was a stressful phone call and the blood, yeah. the patient's blood sugar just spiked. And it's crazy. It's amazing. It's, it, it's, 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 it is. Yeah. And, and it's, I, it's I important. It's been, it's been underestimated even in the low yeah. carb community, I think. I think yeah. I think it's something that, like there definitely are people talking about this, but there, again, it's kind of, it's put forward as kind of fine print. And actually I'm at the point yeah. where I think, if someone comes to you and they're really wanting to achieve goals, and often they've already been trying low carb or keto or something else to achieve either a PCOS fertility goal or a weight loss goal, but they haven't had that addressed. They have, you know, they've got deep childhood emotional trauma that manifests through their their chaotic life mm-hmm. and adult life or something, and they just they 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 feel like their cortisol is normal. That's where it's always been, you know, cortisol is averaging around six hundred. You know, like that's been their whole life experience, but. It says someone actually pulls them up on that and says, "Hey, this is actually a major driver for you. I think this is why you're failing at this. You know why this is not working for you because you know cortisol promotes gluconeogenesis. And and even if you are not eating, I mean, these women, these one meal a day carnivore people, these people are not lying to me. They are they haven't eaten a carb in a year, like not not a gram, you know. Yeah. And and yet their yeah. blood sugars are running in the sevens, and it's it's gluconeogenesis driven and." 
and there are some good people, um, you know, Dr. Boz in the US, uh, you know, a, a physician over there, she she talks about this too and puts people on super high fat, low low protein and low carb diets to try and overcome this and I think has has some degree of success with that. Um, but yeah, like it's again, I think it's like it's, it's, not, it's not a unique idea, a unique concept, and so I'm trying to say that. But I think that it's it needs to become uh, come to the fore a bit more. I think it is, is a major issue for many many people who who suffer metabolic syndrome. And again, I often have consults where I say, well, okay, well, why why are you eating like this in the first place? And often these people are comfort eating in the first place. And, you know, this whole this whole concept, of polyvagal theory and the kind of stuff that Gabor Mate talks about, you know, like that people people can't come into their, come out of their fight or flight or their freeze or fawn response um, very easily. And people have had a lot of emotional trauma throughout their life, a lot of relational trauma. They can't do that. And yeah. a lot of a lot of people use food because you can't you can't you can't have a you know a disjunction between your 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 psycho and physiological state. So if you pull your physiological state down into rest and digest by eating, then your 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 psychology has to follow you down. And so that's the that's the basis of com- of comfort eating. And and how many of these people are overweight people with metabolic syndrome have not been comfort eating to some extent during their life? And so you know, both from a practical and from a psychophysiological uh, point of view, I think it's essential that we start talking about um, chronic stress and, and the impacts of cortisol. Yeah, no, and and it, it reminds me thinking holistically. Um, you know, they say is that you you ask the question: Is there room in your life for a baby? And is there room to bring another life into the world? And if there's so much going on in your personal life it, at work. Um, you know, with the, with your partner, that you're so stressed all the time that you don't have time to relax, do the self care, look after yourself. Then, really, is there room in in your life for for a child? And um, I think maybe taking a pause and 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 people having to think about that question, they might save themselves um, a lot of heartache and effort in in terms of running a hundred, uh, you know, a hundred miles an hour in first gear in one direction when maybe sorting through some of these deep emotional traumas and the root roots of why they're they're overeating might be might be a a, a better strategy or, or a more sustainable long-term strategy in, in in the first place do you do you measure cortisol what's your or uh either saliva in the saliva or, or in the blood yeah it's a, it's a good question i, I look i i I often lament that there's not a, a CGM for cortisol because I'd love to see that. Um, uh, look, I, I do a spot cortisol, I do a spot blood cortisol, um, at, you know, fasting, which is usually, you know, just post-dawn, um, just, to, just to say, you know, where is it? Like as a one-off. So, look, no, no, I don't usually put people through a 24-hour urine collection or, or a salivary uh, series or something. But um, And I guess what I say to people too is that, like, uh, you know, just because it's normal at the moment, what's the average, you know? And um, so I think if you suspect that it's really driving things for people, I think a CGM and then watching these bizarre glucose spikes that are completely unexplained, separate from meals, but and getting people to diarise stressful events or even a panic attack or some other stressful, you know, adrenal type, type symptom, um, a run of those symptoms, uh, and, and to, to see themselves, the connection between those. So I guess, I guess no, and I'm not doing it. I mean, often I do spot cortisols, and they are six or seven hundred, you know, or someone has has measured one at some point at six or seven hundred, but they don't have Cushing syndrome. They don't have, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, medically measurable chronic cortisol overload. Um, but it's the other thing too is like, well, you know, we also know that in you know, elite athletes in particular, they get monitored a lot now that if you overtrain, you know, your cortisol actually gets depleted over time. So this whole cortisol depletion uh, is actually, um, you know, uh, a real phenomenon too. So in, in, in chronic, chronic overexercises or for people who suffer chronic emotional stress, you know, are we seeing cycles of massive overproduction and then depletion, massive mm-hmm. overproduction? And I, I don't think the data's there. I certainly haven't chased it down down through the deep into the literature, but I don't think endocrinologists are chasing that particularly hard. It's sort of you've either got Cushing's or you haven't, and if you haven't got it, then you get dismissed. And and I have a number of patients who have been through that. Um, and so I, I think there's more to it. I think it needs a sophisticated um, lens put over it. But no, the, the answer, short answer is no, I don't. I don't. I just do a spot blood cortisol. And then I guess if you suspect it's running, get get someone on a CGM and 
and diarise experience and, and and known stresses and see whether that's that's correlating to uh, unexplained spikes in blood glucose. Yeah, great. And and the other factor that I wanted to get your opinion on is leptin resistance, because there's an area. I mean, it, it's it's emerging, and and I think Dr. Jack Cruz is the kind of godfather of the kind of mitochondrial quantum and circadian type medicine. Um, and he's been talking about leptin resistance for for a very long time, and the fact that exposure to blue light and artificial light um, off a dark um, exposure to even uh, non native electromagnetic fields basically induces or contributes to um, leptin resistance that could perhaps even precede insulin resistance, but definitely exacerbate the whole metabolic uh, issue with um, with the consumption of refined food. So do you have any takes on, on leptin resistance? Yeah, look, it, absolutely. It's fa- it's a fascinating space, isn't it? And and I think it's we're only in the beginning, really. I think to to scratch the surface of that. And um, look, it's absolutely part of it. You know, like I said right at the beginning, you know, um, uh, ghrelin and leptin are definitely both involved in polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, and and even from that, just going back to you know an evolutionary understanding of medicine and health, like you know. Uh, if, if the food suddenly comes on, you know, is insulin the only driver of increase in fertility? No, of course it's not. It's going to be a whole range of hormones. And I think ghrelin and leptin are both going to be involved. They are involved mm-hmm. in the process. And again, we, how much we actually understand about that is is debatable. But yeah, look, it's, I think it's really, really important. Um, and to look at all of the all of the the drivers of that, both dietary and, and, and otherwise. And even yeah. again, thinking about cortisol and what's cortisol doing doing to to leptin and um, yes. and ghrelin and um yeah and, and so th- it's almost like we have this we've created this perfect storm haven't we between yeah. you know inactivity lots of blue light lots of inside vitamin d deficiency from but not, not eating animal fat that contains vitamin d not not getting enough sunlight because we're so paranoid about about skin cancer particularly in australia um but we're also just not going outside very often and then yeah. a whole lot of blue light you know, uh, major disruption to circadian rhythm, particularly in yeah. young people who are, you know, staying up all night and then sleeping in the day. Sleeping you know, next like to the Wi-Fi router. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> that too. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and it's yeah. like these people are like, you know, we talk about um, shift workers uh, and the, the disease impacts that shift work has on people. Well, it doesn't matter why you're staying up and why you're not following your natural sleep rhythm, whether it's for work reasons or whether you're gaming until 5 a.m. or you know, or, or just, just on TikTok till 3 a.m. Like yeah. it doesn't matter why your sleep patterns are disrupted. The impacts of those disruptions are really well quite well, well studied now yeah. for, for decades. And yeah. and yeah. they're really quite phenomenal. And so we add, add that into the mix, absolutely. And and how does that act? I mean, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, leptin definitely, ghrelin, insulin, cortisol. Um, yeah, and so it becomes this perfect storm where, you know, you're living on McDonald's and Coke and Twinkies and you're staying up till 5 a.m. and you're not getting any sunlight and you're not getting any fresh air and you're not moving your body very well and, you know, and here we are. And, and you're also putting endocrine disruptors on your face in all your cosmetics and you're washing your hair in, um, you know, substances that contain phthalate um, and you're drinking a, a, a coffee out of a plastic cup um, which has probably got some form of um, BPA or, or that's rendered uh, accessible by the boiling water. I mean, so, so, I mean, how, how exactly is a perfect storm is exactly the way to describe it, Peter, because we've got endocrine disruption happening on multiple levels, exogenously, endogenously in the body, um, constantly. So, um, no wonder we're seeing, you know, 20 follicles on every ovary and no wonder why everyone's fasting insulin is deranged and, and the cortisol is raised because as we've talked about, there's so many factors that are 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 different and and um different from our evolutionary niche uh as as humans so um i i i think it's actually a good point to to raise the point about uh you mentioned endocrinologists aren't interested in this holistic uh view of of picos um what is the, the the kind of mainstream approach to a lady Typical patient like yours, um, in terms of yeah, typical uh, PCOS patient. Yeah, yeah well, often yeah. they see. I mean, you know, I, I, I guess you know, a mainstream, just general GP. I mean, I'm not a mainstream GP, but it, but I guess someone who is not particularly, um, you know, diet literate um, GP, they might not be, it might be missed, it might not be spotted. Often people yeah. come with it with the you know uh, a single problem. Unfortunately, our general practice system 
um, you know, is set up so that um, people who, you know, the whole churn and burn just ripping through five-minute medicine, mm. those people get paid more than people who do quality medicine. So yeah. there's this perverse subsidy, perverse perverse distortion in our Medicare system to do five-minute medicine. So if someone goes and sees one of those doctors, um, formerly bulk billing, now they, they're all charging as well, but, uh, you know, bulk billing doctor, they'll, they'll, they'll come with a problem and they'll get a solution to that problem. And if the problem is acne, They'll, they'll, they'll get Rakutane or they'll get doxycycline. Here's, here's, here's some antibiotics for your acne. Thanks very much. Uh, go away. Didn't even ask about your period. You know, or if they come with, you know, my periods are regular or they're heavy or they're, you know, and, or they're not coming anymore or they're problematic, you know, here, here's, here's the combined pill. And it's, a, it's three minute medicine and, and, or even a pill for your acne. Because again, people, people do know the link. So do, doctors do know the link between, between, uh, you know, acne and, 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 um, reproductive cycle so you have have have, a, have the pill control your acne and and see you later and if, you, if that doesn't work we'll give you some racutane on top of that and if you don't go crazy or if you do go crazy have doxycycline instead and so on so it's kind of it's it's five-minute medicine here have a pill get out of my room and um so that that's the usual treatment and then i think that, that then you start to see those people as they come back with primary infertility so they're trying to have their first mm-hmm. child they've gone off the pill i think it's going to be easy they've turned 30 you know and and then they have trouble conceiving and um yeah and then they might go and see someone they might even get a diagnosis as a polycystic ovarian syndrome um and again what 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 is the you know the therapeutic guidelines for australia or even up to date you know internationally what are those literature summarizing guidelines say so say they will you know uh lose weight and uh and uh take metformin you mm-hmm. know so again i mean this is one of the things that really i find very puzzling is that like how are we giving out metformin for this for this disease? This is why my argument about type four diabetes. You know, if we're giving out metformin, a diabetic drug, and we know that that it helps to some extent, um, and as as do the new the new injectables, apparently they 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 you know apparently help help to some extent as well. And as any as any other drug or or herbal or anything else that that often uh, promoted on social media for, for PCOS, that 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 um, you know help uh, reduce insulin resistance. Yeah, yes, to some extent, and when I say some extent, I think five to ten or maybe fifteen percent improvement in your PCOS. I don't think it's major. It's not like you're suddenly fertile after taking five hundred milligrams of metformin for a week, you know. And yeah. and so they, they offer moderate improvement, mild improvement um, in that. And then, so that's that's usually the treatment. And then and then if that fails, you go to an IVF specialist. Yeah. And and depending on the IVF specialist, how interventionist they are, they might offer you um, a hormonal override. To, um, to 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 you know, stimulate ovulation naturally and try that, but I find those those people are relatively rare, and that most people um, will um, so they use a, use a combination. Well, there's different different ways of doing that, right? But um, you know, uh, aromatase inhibitors um, to stop um, you know, you know uh, uh, estrogen and 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 then you know stimulate with with um, with, with both estrogen and progesterone at different times during the cycle, depending on which which strategy they're doing. But yeah, uh, and then and then often rushed off to um, you know egg harvest and standard um, IVF cycles at enormous cost. Yeah, uh, and you see a lot of people you know they're pulling out their superannuation in Australia um, to use that for for IVF, um, and they've never tried this other way. You know, they never tried tried never never tried a six months yeah. of diet change. Um, and, and, and then that's the monetary cost, right? But IVF is incredibly difficult for women in particular, but it takes enormous tolls on couples. Uh, and even if people end up with a baby at the end of it, often, you know, there's really lasting damage to both the, the, the woman's psyche, but also the relationship as a result yeah. of that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, no, that, I wanted to speak to that. And I want to really emphasize the checkpoints or the number of points where a patient who has some a metabolic problem polycystic ovarian syndrome is being let down along the mm. whole cycle so at the yeah. beginning they might have the signs of PCOS, but they're not even getting diagnosed because the a doctor isn't thinking holistically enough to to point put together the signs of androgenism the hair the male pattern balding or the hirsutism the hair and the acne with um the anovulation the irregular cycles or the, the loss of the period so so one they're not even getting the diagnosis and then they're getting subsequent um, silo treatments for different manifestations. As you said, the Roaccutane for the, the acne, um, 
and all, without again to treating the body holistically, then if the diagnosis of PCOS is made, then the, str- the treatment, as you said, is a diabetic medication called metformin, or increasingly these new medications, semaglutide or Zempic, um, to, to induce weight loss. But the point here, Peter, is no one has a metformin deficiency. These women don't aren't deficient in metformin, and nor are they deficient in in a Zempic. So I mean, it's 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 treating a lifestyle problem with uh, a, a pharmaceutical medication that is simply not un- addressing the root cause of the problem. And then, as you said, the next step is more interventionism in the form of um, IVF treatments, which, as you mentioned, has gone puts an enormous emotional toll on 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 a couple. And again, is just so unnecessary for um for for a couple if they they were simply told from the beginning that you have insulin resistance, you have too much visceral fat, your waist circumference is too large, um, you you're you're having a problem that's caused by the environment. We can solve this with environmental changes, particularly, you know, diet and stress reduction, as we've, we've just discussed. So look, it, it actually makes me quite um, angry. Um, it makes me frustrated for the patients because this is, it's not really fair that they're having to put up with this um, and deal with all these problems for so long um, and go through all this, these issues. I mean, it's, it's, it's really not in the, the best interest of the patient by any means. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's our responsibility, I think, to just continue to educate our colleagues uh, around this and around early diagnosis. And also just directly, like I said, we're fighting uphill battle. You know, it, it takes it takes time to have those conversations to to explain the nuances of this. And unfortunately, our, our Medicare-driven system is, is, is very much biased towards short consults that just don't allow for that quality of care. And so I think increasingly it's going to be direct patient education as well. And I think the message is getting out there both around PCOS, endometriosis and other things like, you know, the social media has been has been very good, um, yeah. a very good tool in some regards, a very bad in other ways, but, but it, it does have some positives. And I think, um, and one of those is uh, around reaching out to people who, who are suffering those symptoms and letting them know. And, yeah, and then the question is, well, what are they going to do about it if they don't have a supportive physician? And um, yeah, and, and and that's why I think you know we're we're really overwhelmed with this work at times. And um, you know, it's great that there's there's more GPs like yourself out there and others that, that are coming on board. Low carb down has been a fantastic community for for Australian doctors um, and, and giving encouragement and advice and and training uh, in this area. But yeah, increasingly. Um, yeah, the, the number of people out there who know what the problem is but really need help and guidance and, and confidence that they're doing the right thing too because often then you meet people who, who have found their way to me uh, or to us and um, they've often tried a, tried a keto diet, didn't quite know how to do it or what exactly they were trying to achieve and they had a lot of negative voices around them around that, you know, you're going to have a heart attack, you're gonna, your cholesterol is going to go to 50 and, mm. you know, like it's, it's, it's no good for you. You're eating all that fat and you're gaining weight and so on and, and like – so, uh, yeah, this is a big role for um, education uh, and I think particularly supporting patients on their journey and providing them with um, the authority to to do what they're already wanting to do or they've already started doing. And yeah. sometimes it's just going to be tweaking them, you know. It's just it's often just support and encouragement yeah. and check in. You do you do a set of bloods every three months and you, and you, and you really guide them through what, what, what the markers are they need to be chasing at home. And yeah. and yeah, I think so. I see increasingly my role as a coach, and it's kind of it's a coach and a support, and um, and like I say, also there's this whole cortisol piece around. You know, have you addressed that? Have you addressed your underlying stresses, um, yeah. both logistical and you know underlying, um, you know, relational or emotional um, yeah. cortisol driven. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I love Lucy Byrne, Dr. Lucy Byrne's approach. Um, she yeah. always talks about physiology and psychology, and you can't do. You can't have success without addressing both of them. So we have yeah, to look absolutely. at what, why we're overeating, why we're using food as an emotional crutch or, or yeah. a, as an addiction, um, and that that is that is so powerful. Before before I let you go, I, I really wanted to get your take on um, optimizing metabolic health prior to conception because I'm in um, I'm about to host a, a workshop here in Aubrey on the on the fifteenth, and I'm going to be talking about the four main areas, which we've actually previewed pretty well on this, this discussion, um, metabolic health, nutrition, toxins with an emphasis on on uh, endocrine disruptors, and finally circadian health. And I guess my goal is to help educate 
people and, and women and couples that if we can get these ducks in a row one year, two years, three years um, or more before even attempting to fall pregnant, then everything that we've just talked about in this uh, podcast is just all moot and not relevant to that person. Um, yeah. What, what would you say in terms of someone, say if someone came to you looking to optimize their fertility, um, what, what, what would you advise and what particularly would you, would you look for in terms of um, a, a assessing that? Yeah, well, I think at the end of the day, a regular cycle is probably the best guide. And, and I say to patients, that I'm happy to check your hormones, but I've never seen the hormones not match the clinical picture. So you tell me what's going on, I'll tell you what your hormones are going to say. And so like a regular cycle is is a fantastic guide to that, you know. And and so I think that 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 has to be the aim. And so I guess, you know, if people don't have a regular cycle, then absolutely, you know, you need to, you need to consider the whole polycystic ovarian syndrome spectrum mm -hmm. and start to work on that. And so really my approach to that is I say to patients, well, there's people at different levels of readiness, you know, depending on where they are on their fertility journey and other, other things. Mm -hmm. But, and I say, look, I, I think that a keto diet, you know, which I would define as less than 20 grams of carbohydrates a day, but ideally being a nutritional ketosis on a, on a, on a blood, blood, you know, on a blood, blood glucose uh, ketone monitor um, would be, would be ideal. But not everyone's going to embrace that for a range yeah. of reasons. Yeah. Right? And, and so I think, yeah, reducing the carbohydrate intake, particularly the, the really simple sugars, but actually, you know, carbs are carbs, right? So reducing your bread, potato, pasta, rice, and fruit. You know, that's that it was like, what are you talking about, doctor? And I said, well, you know, the fruits that contain sugar anyway, you know, I spent a lot of time arguing against fruit. Yeah. I can't believe diabetics are told by diabetic educators to eat fruit and nutritionists to eat fruit all the time. Yeah. You know, bags of fructose they are. And, and yeah. Diet Doctor has a fantastic page about fruits, the old fruits and the, and the current fruits, you know. Yeah. And they're just not the same. And I say to people, well, here's some fruits. Here, tomatoes are fruits, olives, eggplants. There you go, eat those fruits. And they're all very sad about that because they're like, well, I don't like those. Well, they haven't got fructose in them. You're addicted to fructose. So anyway, yeah. don't, don't eat bread, potato, pasta, rice, fruit. Yeah, but at the end of the day, not everyone's going to go for that. And not everyone's going to go for keto, but the carbohydrate reduction, and that might yeah. only be, you know, maybe down to 100 grams a day. And processed food, like you're talking about, you know, get rid of the phytoestrogens. In, in a lot of the seed oils and, mm. and, and and other other soy products, get you know and, and get the chemicals out of your, out of your diet if you can, mm. uh, and out of your life more than even in your diet. Like you know, yeah. examine examine your like you said your cosmetic cupboard and your cleaning cupboard as much as um, the organic food that you know you, you might be you might be buying or not buying. And so uh, think about all of those things. Um, yeah, but absolutely. Again, to come back to my my latest rant around cortisol, like you know, start planning. You know, do do a really really big assessment on mm. on your readiness to have a family, and yeah. are you actually ready to become a parent? Yeah. I quite often recommend parenting books, particularly uh, the one written by Gabor and Gordon Newfeld. You know, it's about ten years old now. Hold on to your kids. I love that book. I think it's great. Attachment theory. You know, yeah. like read this stuff and see whether you've got your own stuff to sort out first. Yeah. And is that driving your cortisol as well? So it, that's that's a fantastic thing to get sorted if you can. Yeah. And I've had some families that have been really delayed in their fertility. But actually, have done a lot of that groundwork both individually and then as a couple. And when they finally, you know, fall pregnant, like two years later, they are completely different individuals to what yeah. they were, and they're just so ready to parent, and they know who they are, yeah. and they have this real, you know, authenticity about them, and, and they're and they're ready to 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 care for it for someone else. So I think, yeah, absolutely, clean things up. But particularly, get rid of the carbs and and look at look at cortisol and stress. And you know, and yeah. if you're stressed now, like you were saying before, it's a really good point. If you're already stressed about work, your relationship, your broader family, your friends, or your logistics, your mortgage stress, or whatever, like this stuff doesn't get better when you put kids in the mix. No. You know? and it gets dramatically more difficult to manage. So, um, yeah. I think some real life coaching and planning and five year plans and you know just getting people thinking about what it is they're trying to achieve, what the purpose of, of their life is and what, the, what yeah. why they want to do this and are they ready logistically, emotionally and physically. And yeah. so I think there's a lot of work to do on, on that. It's, but it's about being holistic. I love that. I really love that holistic message. And it's, as you said, build the foundation. It's about building the foundation on, on, on solidly, um, not not on on stilts. You want it to be built on granite and bedrock. And I, and I really love how this conversation started with uh, – with biochemistry and and the intricate details of, of physiology and it's ended as a uh, call for self-discovery <laughs> and, and yeah. self-realization and deep deep introspection 
Um, yeah, and absolutely. I, I, I really feel like as GPs and holistic doctors, that is at the bottom. Um, you know, all these health that we that we kind of trying to understand and trying to, to diagnose and understand, um, especially with lifestyle diseases, it at the bottom is is how we are as as people. What what are we dealing with? What's our social situation? What's driving, um, you know, our behaviors, our addictions, our fears, our, our stresses. Um, yeah. So yeah, get, getting answers or doing the deep work on on yourself, as I like to call it, doing the deep work um, will help you so much in kind of uh, yeah, or everything we've talked about. Um, I, I'd like to before we wrap it up, Peter, talk a little bit about regenerative agriculture because. Uh, as you know, yeah. that's a, a facet of this podcast that I'm really, really passionate about. And yep. like I like to say, we're encouraging people to eat a diet that's rich in animal foods and that's rich in a- animal fats and animal products. And and it, I think it's an obligation to therefore be sourcing that animal food from the most nutrient dense sources, but also from the most ethical sources. And it's my opinion that that regenerative farming. Uh, it kind of ticks all those boxes. So, yeah, what, what, what's your take on, on regenerative farming and, and maybe uh, sourcing? Yeah, well, well, well like, like you, Max, I've been on a similar journey, you know, and, and I think, uh, as you say, like if ten, you know, 8 to 10 billion people are going to eat a high-protein, low-carb diet, how, how the heck are we going to actually do that and do it in a sustainable way? And where's that protein going to come from? Um, and... So, yeah, I, look, I've been on a, I don't know, 20, 30-year, you know, a ho- hobby research journey down down this, this this path myself and, you know, certainly familiar with the work of, of Alan Savory but also people in the permaculture movement, you know, um, David Holmgren and, and Jeff Lawton and, but also guys like Darren Doherty, he's a Victorian permaculture guy, does a lot of broad acre dry land stuff and he, he you know, uh, embraces the techniques of... Um, P.A. Yeomans, and you probably know about Yeomans and the and key line farming. And he's a guy from New South Wales. I mean, this fantastic system, I think 60s, 50s and 60s. And there's it, it even a Yeomans plough that's used around the world now for key line farming to, to build up carbon in the soils, probably more rapidly even than the savoury method. Wow. And so, you know, looking at, um, at these sort of things, at Ernst Gosch as well, you know, syntropic agriculture, in Brazil, and now that's going globally. There's elements of that in Australia as well. So, uh, yeah, look, absolutely. I think you know it's our responsibility too to say, you know, okay, go go and eat eat lots of protein and and, and lots of fat. Or where's it coming from? And I, t- I totally agree with you. I think sustainable agriculture is is a vital part of this. And I, I think one thing that we haven't really touched on today, and, and to be honest, I'm not I'm no expert on this, but I'm, I'm just looking at the um, the synthetic meat movement and how that's growing and how there are some, uh, you know, fairly influential, uh, you know, uh, global s- s- scale voices who mm. are well and truly invested in that and pushing that very hard and pushing the environmental barrow around that very hard as well. Yeah, and I, I think, like, you know, I, I've, 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 I've experimented with a range of diets over my own life. I've been on a keto diet for over five years now myself. But I, I, at stages, I was a vegan for a long period of time, you know, yeah. and, 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 so, and then part of the journey out of that was to examine the environmental impacts of that diet and, and the food miles of that diet. So, like, I think the point is, without going into the details of it here and now, is there are many elements to, to describing what, what is a, what is a low carbon diet? How do you measure that carbon? And, yeah. and um, what is an ethical diet um, from a range of perspectives, not just animal animal welfare, but also environmental impacts um, and, and thinking about food miles, but also local impacts and so on. And the impacts on, on populations that get displaced, you know, for, for things like seed oils uh, around the world, um, particularly Southeast Asia, you know, palm oil plantations and, and, you know, the deforestation associated with that. And, so, um, look, I think it's it's a really uh, it's, a, it's a topic that's very close to my heart, and it's fantastic to come on this podcast with someone else who shares both of my uh, major passions. And um, it's so, yeah, look, I mean, I just say yeah, I completely agree. I think it's really vital that we we continue to promote sustainable and, and regenerative agriculture because I do believe that it can be regenerative at the same time as providing a lot of protein and fat to a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I guess the theme or the analogy is that when you deindustrialize your diet, so should we deindustrialize your agriculture? And the the food products that come from industrialized uh, agriculture are going to make you sick. They're going to give you PCOS. Um, and the food products that come from holistically grazed, regeneratively farmed um, farms are going to cure you 
of your lifestyle diseases, including PCOS. So mm. that's that's why I have such a passion and, and people who followed this podcast will listen to my chats with with good friend Jake Wolke and, and a range of other regenerative farmers because they're doing the boots on the ground work in terms of providing the healing food uh, that people can use to um, resolve these hormonal issues. Absolutely. Um, great. Well, well, Peter, thank you so much for a great conversation. Do you have any parting words uh, for the listeners? And um, after that, just let us know where, where they can get in touch with you. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, like I say, get off the fruit, reduce your carbs, you know, uh, and and yeah, get get involved in a you know an agricultural uh, you know a farm share agricultural scheme as well, and support your local uh, sustainable farmer. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, we, I can be contacted at Yarra Trail Medical if anyone wants to get in touch, uh, and I'm also in the process of setting up a website. Uh, it's, it's keto fertility, keto with two e, so keto fertility uh, dot com and uh, hopefully, if I ever get some spare time, we'll put some content up there about um, you know a program that we'll probably run uh, for people who are wanting to try and overcome their polycystic ovarian syndrome with uh, a, a low carb ketogenic approach. Okay, great. Well, fantastic, and thanks again, Peter, for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us. Thanks very much for your time. I enjoyed it. <laughs>